Welcome, Oakwood family. We are so glad you're here today joining us for Online Church this Sunday, August 9th. My name is Amy Rose, and I'm gonna be one of your online hosts, along with Pastor Jordan Cash. And we would love it if you jumped on over to Facebook so we can interact with you more, encourage one another, and pray with each other while we watch service together. Man, Pastor Ray is gonna be delivering a dynamite message today from the book of Daniel that's gonna ask the question, how do we thrive and live in chaotic times? So as we prepare our hearts for a time of worship, let me pray for us. Father God, I just am praising you for the safe return of Pastor Ray, for our church body as followers of Jesus Christ. And God, I'm just gonna ask that this week you plant little seeds in our hearts to help us find ways to be creative in how we connect with people. Because God, we need community. Christians were called to live in community with each other, and we need that now more than ever. God, I lift up all our teachers and administrators, our parents and students, to give them strength, wisdom, and peace with the difficult decisions that they're having to make for their families. God, I ask also for your healing hand on those that are sick and hurting, and that they just feel your presence um, are all around them. God, we love you with all our heart and soul, and we just ask that you help us be the hands and feet of Jesus as we further your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, welcome to worship with us. Please join as we worship the Lord together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above all kings Yeah, this is amazing grace This is our failing love you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphans a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ. Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living Seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is a victory Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, 
This morning, Pastor Ray is talking about Daniel and how Daniel lived through uncertain times. And that's something that we right now, we can relate to. And so we just need to be reminded that in uncertain times that we need to turn our attention to Jesus. Oh, so are you troubled no light in the darkness you see there's light for a look at the Savior life more abundant and free and turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth shall grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we followed him there. O'er us sin no more has dominion, for more than conquerors we are. And turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow In the light of his glory and grace. Hey, happy Sunday to you, man. It is great uh, to be back with you and great to see you. I hope this finds you doing well and your family doing well. Uh, before we get started today, I just want to say uh, uh, some thank yous. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Pastor Rusty and Pastor Brett for uh, preaching uh, during the time that I was gone. And then they do a fabulous job. I appreciate that so very much. Uh, secondly, a, a word of appreciation and a word of thanks to you. Uh, and uh, as we've gone through this experience together, uh, God has uh, just used you in so many ways. And uh, thank you for your giving and your faithfulness uh, to the church. We appreciate that very much. Hope you'll continue to do that as we continue to do uh, the Lord's work in these, uh, in these challenging, challenging times. And really appreciate your help uh, with that as well. And I want to say a personal word of thanks. I, I want to thank all of you that... Uh, uh, drop me uh, notes uh, in the mail uh, and uh, text messages uh, of encouragement and your love and appreciation. Uh, sometimes I wish when you send me a text message, though, just a little word, uh, put your name on it so I'll know who to be uh, happy and thank and pray, pray for uh, because I don't have all your numbers in my phone. But I thank you for the kind words that you express. One morning I was reading uh, one of my books I took this summer about pastoring and how to be a better pastor. And I was reading a passage in Hebrews chapter 13 uh, that the book was talking about. And, and it was about, uh, about leaders and, and how that as a, 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 we ought to be submissive to those who are spiritual leaders who keep watch over our soul. 
And that night I had gotten the sweet text message. And then right about that time, I, my phone uh, buzzed out and another nice text message. And, and that verse just came real to me because it says this at the end of it in Hebrews 13. I think it's verse 17, verse 18. It, it, says, it says, you know, make it a joy, make it a joy and not a burden uh, to those who serve and keep watch over your soul. And, and I want to tell you, I thank you for your kindness to me. Uh, it makes it a joy and not a burden. And I appreciate that so very much uh, as we have gone through this experience together. Now, many of you are asking and wondering, okay, Ray, but when are we going to get back together in in-person services? If you remember back in the spring, we started talking to you about this road to reunion uh, that we were on, and we talked about the triangle of decision, how we're going to try to follow God's will, and how we're going to listen to wise, trusted advisors and health professionals, and then the congregation and the uh, survey that we did to the congregation. And so we were on. I think we were doing great. I felt like all of our services that were in person as well as online were doing well. Uh, no one I don't feel is at risk. The health professionals I've talked to said, uh, that our protocols here at church, uh, we did everything we were supposed to do. Uh, but then when cases here in Comal County uh, began to just escalate in June and the first part of July, we just thought it was best to put a pause. As I've been jokingly saying, on the road to reunion, we pulled over in the Buckies. Uh, unfortunately, we stayed a little longer than we thought we were going to have to stay. But the good news is, is that we are starting to see uh, some better numbers and some decline in the number of cases that are announced uh, every single day. And so that's a good sign. And so if that continues, what we have targeted right now is on August the 23rd, that Sunday, August the 23rd, that we'll go back to three in-person services at 8, 9.30, and 11 o'clock, and then, of course, continue to be online. And then in the coming weeks ahead, we'll announce to you what we hope to be doing in some more openings of other ministries and other opportunities uh, for you to engage uh, and grow in the Lord. And so you be in prayer for that. I want to encourage you uh, to, to do everything you can uh, to, to help our community, uh, to get our schools open, uh, to keep our businesses open, uh, to get our churches open and fully, but let, let's do every, guys, you know, it's not time now uh, to argue and debate and, and all of that. It's time to come together and do what's suggested to us and advised to us and, and see what God might do. And so I want to encourage you to do that and be a part of that. Uh, when we come back, uh, the only change in our protocol that we have is we're going to ask you to wear a mask uh, to come to church uh, during that time. And I realize some of you, you may view that as an affront to your freedom or whatever. Uh, that, that, that's okay. That's what you feel. Uh, but we're going to ask you to watch online uh, then instead because we really want to make sure that here everything we're doing is a part of a solution and not a part of contributing uh, to the spread of the virus. And uh, we're just going to work together and I pray we'll come together and be able to, uh, to get through this experience together. Hey, would you bow with me in prayer uh, as we read uh, Scripture and, uh, and pray uh, together? A psalmist says in Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, uh, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him? Would you pray with me? Father, when we think about how awesome you are, how majestic you are, how great you are, it does, we join in the words of the psalmist and we are absolutely amazed, as David said, that you would be mindful of us, that you'd care for us. Just the little part of the universe that we occupy, that you would love us. But Father, you do love us and you care for us and you have reached down and showed and demonstrated your love for us uh, in giving us Christ Jesus to give us life for us, to conquer death, to provide life for us for all of eternity. Father, you have cared for us in the greatest way of all. Thank you that you are mindful of us. 
Thank you that we're on your radar, that you see us, that you know us, that you know everything about us, and that you love us. And so, Father, in your great care and in your great understanding, would you now, through the power and the working of the Spirit of God, would you fill us with your word? Would you help us to grow, to have a clearer vision, to see you and to see how you want us to be as your children, as your servants? So, Father, I pray today that you would speak into our lives. And I ask this all in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Life is fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal has seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day -day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong. Hey man, in these last number of months since the spring, has it ever crossed your mind or gone through your mouth, through your lips, where you have said, man, these are the craziest times I've ever seen in my life? I mean, have you ever thought some days, man, the whole world is just going smash? How are we going to get through this? Everything around us seems to be uh, chaotic. So the question we're going to talk about today uh, from our readings in the Old Testament that we're looking at in the book of Daniel is we're going to talk about how do we live and thrive in the midst of chaotic times? How do we stay the people of God and be the people that God wants us to be even in the midst of chaotic times, even in the midst of difficult days? Now, the guy we're going to look at today in the life of Daniel is living in some pretty chaotic times. But we're also going to look at how Jesus, how Paul the Apostle, how Paul, how Peter the Apostle, how they all lived in chaotic times. I mean, as you've been doing your Bible reading, have you noticed about how many of great men and women of God uh, that we've just read in the Old Testament and then as we're going to read in the New Testament as well, that were living in, in crazy times, in times when there were limits to their freedoms and abilities, when they were under the heavy hand of, uh, of rulers that were occupying their land. And that's what we're going to look at in the life of Daniel. And Daniel did not just survive those times. Daniel thrived during those times. Daniel was God's man along with three other young men at just the right time. Daniel and these three friends of his are going to be part of the remnant of God that God is going to raise up and restore one day the kingdom of Israel. Now, we've been reading. Man, doesn't it seem like we've been reading and reading and reading. God saying for now decades to his people, hey, you better shape up and, and, and you better start flying right. And if you, don't, if you don't get your act together, 
If you don't stop worshiping pagan gods, if you don't stop your injustice and you're taking advantage of, of, of those that have no voice, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send judgment. We read in Habakkuk in that little book where he talks about, I'm sending judgment and it's going to be bad. You think it's going to be bad. It's going to be worse, Habakkuk, than you even thought. Well, what we're going to read in Daniel chapter 1 is, is that God was exactly spot on correct. It was bad. So if you have your Bibles, grab them, turn to Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 3. Now, Daniel, uh, what, what's happened is the Babylonians have come, and they have taken uh, the king of Judah. Uh, they have occupied the land. Uh, they have burned the temple down. They burned their place of worship down. Uh, it tells us earlier in chapter 1 uh, that they carried off uh, the uh, objects of worship that were in the temple of God and that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylons, uh, took those and put them in his temple, put them in a pagan temple uh, and made them his uh, tokens or his, his little devices of, uh, of conquering uh, the land of Judah. And so it seems almost on the surface is that, that if the pagan God has won and that God has lost. But that's not the case because God is always working. In fact, if you read the first part, you will read that all of this is happening uh, because God has allowed it to happen, because God said it was going to happen. But God is always doing something. And he's going to show us in Daniel's life how we today in 2020, in the middle of a chaotic pandemic and some crazy times, how we ought to live, and how we ought to be the people of God. So let's look, begin reading in verse 3 of Daniel chapter 1. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature, the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. Uh, they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief officials gave them, though, new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should, why, why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servant for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then compare our, our appearance with those of the young men who ate the royal food and treat your servants in accordance into what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young, man, young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine uh, that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked to them 
and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So they entered the king's service, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them, watch this, ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now the book of Daniel covers the life of this man from the time that he is a young teenage boy until he is 80 years old. For 70 years, he is going to be of use in the, in the king of the Babylonians' royal court. Now, often we think of Daniel because most of the time when we see his picture or when we just think of him in the lion's den, we think of him as an old man. But when Daniel chapter 1 here is talking about Daniel not as a, a old man, it's talking about him as a young man, as a young teenage boy. Now, when it says there in verse uh, th 4, uh, get some young men, uh, that would mean that that age would be anywhere from th 13 years old to 19 years old. Most would agree that it was somewhere between 13 and 14 or 15. So we're talking about young teenage boys, young men. Now, why did Nebuchadnezzar do that? Now, Nebuchadnezzar is not foolish. He knows exactly what he's doing. Notice what it says of what these were to be. They were to be a part of the royal family, or our nobility. These young men were the cream of the crop, if you will. These men came from families that were of nobility and, and the royal household. Uh, these were the, the upper, the elite, the 1%, the, the maybe you would say, of Judah. And so they picked the very best young men they could find. And there were, as you can see here, some requirements it had to be. There were not to be any physical defects, no deformities in these young men. Uh, they were to be handsome, so they were to be pleasant to the eye, good looking guys. Uh, they were to show aptitude of every kind, learned, well informed. Uh, these, are not, these are not the bottom shelf performers, bottom level performers. No, no, these were, these were young men that were already in the advanced classes at school. Now, they were already excelling. They were already well informed about what was going on and well read. And they were quick learners. And so, so he went and he picked ones with quick understanding that would be qualified to teach in the king's palace, to, to work in the king's palace. So he picks the very best young men. And they notice what he's going to do. He's going to teach them. He's going to teach them. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has picked these young men uh, whose opportunity of being shaped, their opportunity of, of, of gathering a different understanding, the understanding of the way of the Babylonians, uh, their minds were not yet fully, as you might say, developed in their understanding and then their opinions and, and thoughts and views of things. They were shapeable young men. Quick learners, and they were to learn the language, and they were to learn from the books, the literature of the Babylonians. It's interesting in the Hebrew uh, where it says literature, it, it uses the word, in the Hebrew, it uses the word book. The idea is they were to have the book thrown at them. In other words, they were to be so indoctrinated in the literature and the language of the Babylonians that they then would no longer think like young men of nobility from Judah, but they would think like Babylonians. They'd understand like Babylonians. They would no longer be followers of the one true God, but now they would understand the way of the Babylonians and to be followers of multiple gods, of pagan gods. This is what they were shooting for. This is what they wanted. They wanted young men they could shape. And notice what they did. Not only did they put them in this program, it was to last three years. I've been doing some reading about that the last couple of weeks. And what they went through was not uh, easy classes in this three-year program. 
Uh, this is upper level uh, leadership development, upper le master's work, doctoral work of learning and understanding. No, no easy classes. No classes like I did in school, uh, college racquetball, and, you know, underwater basket weaving, stuff like that. No, none of that kind of stuff. This is hard stuff, stuff that was going to require effort. And these young men all excelled. But not only did they put them in this program, notice as well uh, that they also gave them new names. They changed their names. Daniel was given another name. Daniel's name was now Belteshazzar. Now, what does that mean? Well, Belteshazzar was the name after their, as you might say, their number one god, which was named Baal. And so Belteshazzar means the prince of Baal. So they took Daniel, a Hebrew name, and now they've given him a name after a pagan god. Uh, then it says they took, uh, they took Hananiah and they gave him the name Shadrach. Shadrach is after the sun god, Shad. Shadrach means inspired by the sun. They named him after their pagan god. And then it took Mishael and it gave him the name Meshach. That was the name after the god of mirth, the god of merriment, the god of Shack was his name. Of Shack is what Shadrach means. And then it took Azariah. And they gave him the name Abednego, which means the servant of the shining fire, another one of their pagan gods. And so these young boys, now, now, now feel this, feel this. Think of some young man you know that's 13 years old, that's handsome, smart, on top of things, pulled away from their family taken to lay it, live in a strange land that like they had never seen before. We know that the Babylonians and their capital at that time, as historians describe it, was absolutely incredible in its beauty and all of its majesty and all of its power. They were at that time more likely the most powerful people on the face of the earth. Take of your, you think of your son when he was 13 or 14 years old. They pull them out. They teach them a new language. They teach them a whole new way of thinking and understanding. They give them a new name after a pagan god. And some, though it doesn't say it in this text, many commentators would agree, some disagree. Josephus would say in his history uh, that it would be true that when you served in the royal court of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you were made into a, a, a eunuch. In other words, these young men were emasculated. Their manhood taken away, many believe. Now imagine that. Forced. A 13, a 14-year-old young man living in that situation, going through all of those experiences. How would they respond? How will Daniel respond? In this chapter, you don't see any anger and any bitterness from Daniel. Living in, my friend, some pretty chaotic times. I, and I don't even want to compare the chaos of my life or the chaos of your life or the chaos of a pandemic to the life Daniel is living, to the, to the life Hananiah and Mishael and, and Amaziah are living, the chaos they're living through. But how are they going to respond? And what we're going to see is, is that Daniel responds in a way that is like the way of Christ. That Daniel responds in the way that Paul tells us to respond and modeled in our response. He's going to respond the way the apostle Peter told us to respond. The first thing I want you to notice if you're taking notes is this, is that Daniel's ha Daniel had a resolve. It says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. He resolved not to defile himself. He was given a whole new diet to eat. Now, Daniel knew, Daniel knew, he was smart enough to know that the food, there was nothing wrong with the food uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had laid out. It was good food. 
I'm sure it was good wine. I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar from his own house in his own table, he's selecting the menu. <laughs> he's telling the chefs, Here, here's what I want everybody to eat today. He's making that choice. It's not that the food was bad. But Daniel and his three friends would know that this food in a pagan nation had been offered to a pagan god first. And so therefore, in the eyes of a young Hebrew boy, it was unclean. Many of the items were, were, were not of the Hebrew diet, were not of the described dietary law of God. And so it is at this point that Daniel resolves, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tolerate that. that. That word resolve, or in some of your versions, it may say to make up his mind. He made up his mind. That, that in Hebrew means to collect, to collect. In other words, it's like making a, making a rope and you collect various strands and you weave them all together as you continue to collect more and more to make that rope strong and sturdy. Daniel is collecting all of the things. Now watch this, mom, dad. Daniel is collecting all the things that he learned from his mom and dad. All the things that he learned from the teaching of the law of God. He's bringing all of those together. The word means to collect, to make something strong. Daniel is going to be strong because he collected his mind. He collected all those things. Mom, dad, don't ever think you are wasting your time in stealing into your life of your child the word of God. You are not wasting your time. You are helping them to collect something that may pay incredible dividends. One day when they got to make up their mind. One day while they got to resolve. That's why I say to you that it is a far greater investment in the life of your child. Their spiritual devel development is far greater than any athletic or any artistic or any kind of other adventure experience or talent they may have. Because when it's all said and done, it's where you are spiritually that's going to make the biggest difference. For all of eternity, David resolved. David said, you know what, this, this is where we stop here. I find that interesting, that, that Daniel wasn't like a lot of modern-day Christians. I mean, a lot of modern-day Christians, they're, they're ready to fight about everything. I mean, every single thing is an affront to their faith. Everything is an affront to them, and they're offended by everything. Everything bothers them. Everything, I, I watched this, I saw this, I read this, this just makes me so mad. I'm so, Daniel doesn't do that. Daniel doesn't say here, Daniel said, now, hey, what about this name change stuff? Can I keep my good name? Can I keep my Daniel name? He doesn't say that. He doesn't argue about all the literature that he's got to read and the new language classes that he's got to take or the three-year program. Not, not to mention whether it happened or not, I don't know, but not to mention uh, being, becoming a eunuch. <laughs> I mean, you don't find Daniel fighting all of those things. No, when it came to breaking the law of God, and compromising in that area of his life. Daniel said, no, I, 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 I made my mind up. I don't want to defile myself. You see, that's the, that's the key of making an advanced decision in your life. If you want to resolve to be the man or the, the, young, the lady that God wants you to be, decide now. now don't wait until the heat of the moment. Don't wait until the temptation and go, well, now let me think about what I want to do. Let me collect my thoughts because you're not going to be able to collect your thoughts because other things now have captivated our minds. That's why advanced decision-making, sir, is what's best before you go on that out-of-town trip and you're going to be all by yourself. That's why it's best, dear lady, to make the decision now before you go on that convention trip and you're going to be off by yourself in a strange town where nobody knows you. And now's the time to make that decision, young person, before you go back to school, of what kind of life you're going to live. Daniel resolved not to defile yourself. Now, now what does he do? What does he do? I love this. I love this. He, he don't go and say, well, you know what? Uh, this cat named, uh, uh, with a weird name, Ashpenaz, Ashpenaz, uh, I won't get rid of him. 
So I'm going to start a petition to try to get rid of Ashpenaz. I'm going to get me a sign. I'm going to paint it all up. And I'm going to say, impeach Aspenaz. Get rid of him. I'm going to lie about him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a stink about him. I'm going to cause all kinds of trouble. That's not what Daniel does at all. Daniel doesn't do that at all. What does Daniel do? Second thing I want you to notice is, I want you to notice Daniel's, Daniel's, I love this, Daniel's gentlemanly behavior. Daniel's gentlemanly behavior. Daniel doesn't cause a stink. Daniel just simply goes, and he goes respectfully, and he goes humbly. We're going to see in a moment. And he says to the chief official, he says to the chief official, uh, can, can we not eat this? Can, can we not drink this? He goes, he goes as a gentleman. He goes gracefully. He goes humbly. Look, notice how he refers to himself in verse 12. Please, please test, test your servant. Test your servant. He doesn't go in arrogance. He doesn't go demanding. He goes asking. And then notice what God does as a result of that kind of behavior. Uh, that that God, God, God gives and grants, it says, he grants favor and sympathy to Daniel. You see, what God is involved in this and what God is doing is God, because of the way Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Amaziah are acting in their appropriate way and honoring God and acting the way God would want them to act, God uses that and causes the, the, the officials to have sympathy and favor towards him. You know, sometimes I encounter people that are that are Christians, professing to be Christians, and that are some of the most ungentlemanly and lady and ladylike people that I've ever met. That I'd not be so. As God's people, even in the midst of chaotic times, we are to remember that we are the people of God and we're to act like the people of God. We're to act in a way that is honoring to God, not, not disrespectful to others. Not always, when you're living in chaotic times, uh, there are one or two things that can happen. That is, you can allow uh, the chaos to squeeze you and shape you into that chaotic life, or you can live under the power of the Spirit of God and be the person God wants you to be. And that is a person that loves God and that loves others that respects, that honors people. Listen to me, let me tell you something. In your place of business, in your work, in your leadership position, whatever it might be, if you are a professing Christian, then you ought to strive to be the most gentlemanly and the most ladylike and the most gracious and the most encouraging and the kindest. Well, now what Jesus did, when you read the Gospels, and we're going to be in the Gospels soon. Man, it can't get here soon enough for me. We're going to get in the Gospels here pretty soon. And you know what you're going to see about the Lord? You're going to see how the Lord is always such a gentleman. He's always so kind. He's always so gracious. You're going to find that in the life of the Apostle Paul. I was reading in the book, book of Acts the other day, Acts 26, 27, somewhere in the latter part of the book of Acts, uh, where, where Paul is before King Agrippa and he's before uh, the ruler Festus. And when you read it, what you see is, is the way that Paul responds to King Agrippa. He don't refer to him as old Agrippa. No, he don't say that. He refers to him by his title, King Agrippa. He doesn't refer to Festus as Festus. He refers to him as, listen to this, most noble Festus. He uses a term of respect and honor to the man in that position. And notice what, notice what uh, Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. He says, live wisely among those who are not believers. And make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Let your, let your conversation be gracious and attractive. I'm going to give you the Pastor Ray Steele version. Let us read that again. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive, whether in person or on social media, wherever you are. Why? Because you're a child of God. 
That's what Daniel is living. That's what Paul encouraged us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, make it your goal. Make it your goal to live a quiet life. Minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live. That, that's Daniel. Will respect the way you live and you'll not need to depend on others. You'll not, they'll, they'll respect that. Because you respond in a way that is appropriate and dignified and Christ-like. Hey, look what he says, Peter says in 1 Peter. He says, now uh, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of, any of their threats. Instead, and then remember, this is a persecuting time. Don't be afraid of that. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about the hope as a believer that you have, always be ready to explain it. Watch this. Watch this. But do it. Do this in a gentle and respectful way. That's exactly what Daniel does. In humility and in gentlemanly behavior, he goes up and says, can I ask you if we can eat something different? Can I ask you if you can just give us vegetables and water? And this guy responds. It's very interesting the way he responds to him. He says, Daniel, I like you. I like you. You're a good guy, but I got to, I got to tell you uh, that the king ain't going to be happy and my head may be gone and separated from my body if you stand before him and you're not in good shape and everybody else who ate the food that he selected from the king's menu, his selection they're healthy and you're weak and anemic. It's going to cost me my head. And that's the third thing I want you to notice about Daniel. And that is Daniel's incredible faith. Daniel's incredible faith. Daniel doesn't think about it. Daniel don't pull off and talk to God about it. Daniel believes God. Daniel believes that God said, this is the way I want you to live. And if you live this way, I'm going to bless you. If you, don't, don't get hung up on the vegetables and water. Don't look at your wife right now because you put on a Corona 10 or a Corona 15 or the Corona 19, whatever it may be. Don't look at them and say, honey, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a biblical plan, plan, vegetables and water from now on. It's don't get hung up on the vegetables and the water. Get hung up on this. Daniel believed his God. He had faith in his God. And he says, I tell you what, you try us for 10 days. You try us for 10 days. And if we don't look better, if we don't look better, then we understand. And that's exactly what happens. And notice what happens after 10 days and after the three-year program's over, they stand before Nebuchadnezzar and God has now put, God has now put, <laughs> this is great, God has now put three faithful followers of the law of God and who love God as leaders in the court of a pagan king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel had faith. Let me ask you this. Let me end with this. Do you have that faith? Are you trusting God? Do you believe God? Do you believe what David said in Psalm 8 that I read to you a moment ago? Who is man that you be mindful of? Do you believe God that, that God's got his mind on you? That God's got his eye on you? that he's thinking about. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he'll never leave you and that he'll never forsake you? Do you believe that you've never seen the righteous beg for bread? Do you believe those promises of God? Or have you just adopted the chaotic world we live in? We live in a toxic culture. The same kind of culture in a way that Daniel and these three boys are living in. It's always trying, listen to me, it's always trying to squeeze us into what it wants us to be. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and heart in Christ Jesus. The world, the culture, toxic always trying to squeeze us, always trying to chaos, trying to make us chaotic, trying to make us torn up inside, trying to make us more and more angry, more and more frustrated, more and more built up, all of those things that maybe you're feeling right in this moment today. 
That's the culture. But are you going to be like a Daniel? Are you going to have faith in your God? The God who says he loves you and that he's with you. How do you live in chaotic times? Keep your eyes on the Lord. Resolve to live out your faith respectfully, kindly, with graciousness. Desire to live your life with a deep and abiding faith that the world may seem like it's going to hell in a handbasket. But you, you a child of the king. You're a kingdom person. You call him God, Abba, Father. Would you bow with me as we pray together? I know that many of you right now are going through times of great uncertainty. I hear that from you. I hear that in conversations I've had with you just since I've been back. I, I hear it in conversations on the phone with you that I've had and others in our staff have had with you as they've talked and gotten through the pleasantries and, and everything's good and then they start to dig and, and then they hear uh, the hurt and the chaos and the problems and the struggles. My friend, these are chaotic times, but God has come to give you a peace and to give me a peace that surpasses all understanding. Would today you dare to live and be like Daniel, like Jesus, like the Apostle Paul, like the Apostle Peter, like the Apostle John? Would you join that great cloud of witnesses? Father God, I pray for the needs of all of those who are watching today, uh, going through all various kinds of struggles. I pray for those that may be ill today, whether it's with the virus or with some other health issue. I pray for those that are caring for people today. Father, we all have so many needs in our family, those that are struggling financially, those that are struggling in their job, wondering about their future. Father, we all have so many needs. But Father, you are such a great and powerful God. And Father, may our faith be strong in you in the same way Daniel's faith was strong in you. May, he believe, may we believe you in what you say, and then may we live accordingly. And we pray this in the strong name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Next week, I'll see you back online. Then remember the 23rd, we hope to meet together. During that time, you pray for the Lord's work, pray for the church, uh, pray for me. I'll be praying for you and pray that in our community, cases continue to drop and people get healthy and strong and less cases and less people sick and dying. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to be back together again. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching with us today. What a great message reminding us that we have a choice, that during these chaotic times, we can let that chaos squeeze us in and we can fall into that trap of living chaotically, or we can live as followers of Jesus Christ by having faith, loving God, and loving others. Listen, we are here for you and your spiritual walk, so if you need us, please don't hesitate to reach out in any way. We love you, we are here for you, and we hope you have a great week of worship. See you next Sunday.